Sorry, I had to send it to the host to approve that recording, I think. Hi, everyone. Welcome. So welcome to Access, Equity, and Empowerment, the critical and practical case for open educational resources. I'd like to give a really big thank you to the entire OER for Social Justice team and to the William H. Hannon Library at Loyola Marymount University for supporting this event. Um, before I introduce our guest speaker, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, the webinar is being recorded and it'll be shared with everyone who registered. Uh, we ask that you keep yourself on mute until the Q&A or during audience participation. Uh, also, feel free to put your questions in chat as we will have Karna um, keeping track of them during the Q&A um, and we'll uh, point them out during the Q&A portion. Um, lastly, if you're having any technical issues, we have Teresa Huff who will be helping out with those. So you could just um, send her a, a message directly and we can try to figure out if you're having any tech issues. So with that, I'm excited to introduce our guest speaker, Maggie Mates. She is an introductory course director and associate teaching professor of communication studies at the University of Kansas. Her research explores feminist rhetoric and critical cultural studies with a particular focus on prison abolition. Building on her experience creating Speak Out, Call In, public speaking as advocacy, Maggie will share how OER can help faculty to integrate social justice principles into high enrollment courses and empower students to enact change in their daily lives. And now I'll turn it over to Maggie. Thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to spending this next chunk of time with you investigating this idea of OER, and in particular, placing OER in conversations with social justice practices and principles. I'm, um, thank you for that great introduction. I'm Dr. Maggie Mapes, she, her. And um, before we really dive in, or I provide an, a specific overview about where the talk will lead us today, I'm gonna ask that we also do some joint introductions. And so if you would, in the chat, um, first, just go ahead and give us your name, although certainly the chat will also tell us, and also your background with OER, Open Educational Resources. And really, you can just include something like, I'm brand new, or I've adopted an open textbook, or I'm thinking of writing an open educational resource, to just give us some idea about folks' experience, background with OER before we really dive in today. So just take a second to go ahead and write that in the chat for me. Excellent. Thank you, few of you who've been able to so far. Looks like already we have some folks who are brand new to OER, some folks who have begun working with it in some capacities, co-writing an OER for social justice, amazing, working to think about adapting OERs on campus. I love that. So happy to have you all joining with us today. The other thing I want to encourage you to do is as not just write your own information in that chat box, but use this as an opportunity to scroll and to really see the kind of community of collaborators, the potential folks who are on your campus or very close to you, who are also committed to some of these questions. If you're like me in my discipline of communication studies, you know, for years I felt kind of on an island about OER. There was no conversations at conferences in publications that were addressing some of these questions. And so I always think this opportunity for introductions is incredibly important so that we're really able to see that we aren't here, um, we're not alone, that there are so many other people who aren't just invested abstractly in the idea of open educational resources, but are really interested in OER at the intersection of social justice. Today's talk is, even if you're brand new, or even if you've written 10 open textbooks, the talk today is really designed to hopefully advance and ask you some important questions, provide you some important insight about OER that you can really apply. Um, so now that I have, we have some idea about who you all are and your background, I'm going to ask you add one additional thing into the chat, which is a barrier, if you have any, 
that you've experienced with OER, if there is some kind of um, a hesitation, um, a difficulty locating a resource, a common question that you get, something that's really difficult for you to be able to implement to succeed, what might those barriers be for you? Well, I can't promise that today's talk will be able to um, answer all of the questions that you have or be able to intervene in all of the barriers or difficulties that you've been able to experience. I'm hopeful that I'll be able to answer many of them and also be able to direct you to places to begin that conversation for you so that you feel more empowered to find answers um, for you all as well. Many of these are very common barriers that we see, finding good graphics, having money, the monies to be able to try to support these efforts, finding um, high quality scientific images, and really thinking about getting other kinds of faculty on board. So please take note of these barriers. If there's a barrier that someone else kind of noted in the chat that you also hadn't thought about or you've experienced, I really suggest that you write it down to kind of keep track of it for yourself. Excellent. If you think of any others, please feel free to use the chat. And now that we have a little bit of an idea about who you all are, um, I'm going to give you just a slight introduction um, into me to see who's going to be talking at you for this next little bit of time. Um, and so uh, like that amazing introduction had noted, I am, uh, in addition to being a faculty member in the Department of Communication Studies at the University of Kansas, I also am our introductory course director. And what that means is I oversee our large multi-course public speaking class. Um, I oversee all of the curriculum. I train all of our graduate students. I supervise all of our lecturers and instructors. And that usually and historically has been about 3,000 students a year, though actually that number will increase yeah, to around four to 4,000 students. Yeah, it's like a little, what do you call it? One. Candy bar. Yeah. There we go. Um, around four, around, uh, excuse me, around 3,000 students uh, a year. In addition um, to that, I also am a presenter for the Open Education Network out of the University of Minnesota. If you aren't familiar, the Open Education Network um, is a community of folks who are really invested in providing resources, increasing awareness, and trying to educate folks about open. In addition, I am what's called the Communication Studies OER founding member. So because Communication Studies didn't really have folks talking about open, uh, we created a Communication Studies listserv. We try and collaborate on conference presentations within our discipline. And I've done workshops that are specific to Communication Studies. And the last thing I'll mention is that I also created a speak out call in public speaking as advocacy in 2019. And this summer, I'm actually creating and writing a second edition of that open textbook. Now, you've gotten like my CD version of background, especially around open. But I want to tell you just one story that I think can be important because this kind of CD framework gives the illusion that I've just been caring about educational resources and talking about open for the entirety of my career. And it's just not the case. Um, I never thought I would be an educational resource advocate. Um, I, all through graduate school and the first part of my career had really assumed that working with a traditional textbook publisher was part of the normal and natural way that we implement educational resources within higher education. And it wasn't until I began my position at KU where I started to ask questions about why publishers were so motivated to come to my office hours, to bring me coffees. Um, I had publishing representatives showing up at my conference presentations. And even though I'm a cool person to hang out with, uh, I knew it wasn't my coolness that was persuading these faculty reps to come and try and knock on my door, that it was the information I provided for you. Those 3,000 students every year, that was about $300,000 in potential textbook revenue that was happening every year. So once I kind of peeled back the layers a little bit, I realized that educational materials are anything but neutral, and that in fact, there are so many important questions to think about when we're considering what educational resources we're embedding into our classrooms, into our curriculum, and how we're advocating for those at our institution. So that's kind of what got me interested in this notion of open, and seven years later, um, here I am. 
So today um, we're going to, like I would mentioned, really talk about social justice and open educational resources. But to do so, I'm going to start briefly by just helping us define what we mean by open and what counts as open educational resources before transitioning into answering the question, why should we use them? And that question of why means we're going to think really critically around the parameters of what open is and place that in conversation with social justice ethics. And finally, we're going to conclude by thinking practically. So how do we do it? If we have this kind of grandiose idea of open as social justice, how can we practically implement those values within into our own classrooms? And of course, there's going to be some time for questions at the end. Let's dive in to this first section then, the idea of what is open. I know that many of you had mentioned at the start that you have some experience with open, might be writing and adapting, but even if you've done tons of work in open, I still think it's really important that we have a clear idea and definition of what we mean by open. And that's because first and foremost, it helps facilitate conversations with our colleagues and with our students about what we mean. Sometimes with open, when I work with folks, they kind of know it when they see it, but aren't exactly sure how to describe exactly what open is. So when we're able to have an idea about the terminology and the definition, it makes us more comfortable and confident in the choices we're making. And that means we can facilitate those conversations more externally with folks who might not have as much knowledge about open as us. And the second reason I think it's important to define open is that to define means to set the parameters of possibility. So only when we're able to have a definition of open are we really able to answer the question, do open educational resources have the potential to um, meet our social justice ends? So what is the idea of open? If you're like me, I came to open with the attractiveness of free, right? that that resource would be free for students that we want them to be able to keep it forever. Um, and so free is oftentimes that entry point, but free is also insufficient because free doesn't, doesn't always communicate the range of possibilities that open provides. So for open, I use this pretty straightforward definition, which means, or defines open as everything included within an educational resource is openly licensed or in the public domain. So that idea of the license becomes the part that's important beyond just the resource being free. Um, and that's because free doesn't help communicate with folks the intention that an author has about what they want you to be able to do with that resource. So if we think about traditional copyright, for example, a kind of all rights reserved, if you were going to assign a chapter of a book, in theory, what you would need to do to be able to have that, to make, have that be possible is request permissions to access that chapter. You might have to pay a fee um, and then the publisher would release that chapter with a license that you could distribute to the students within your course, right, in theory. And that's because um, regular traditional copyright means all rights are reserved. But through open, if our intention is to allow folks to freely copy it, to share it, to keep it forever, then we know that the traditional copyright of all rights reserved is really insufficient because we don't want all the rights to be reserved. We want students to be able to keep it, share it, and have it for free of charge. So when we think about the definition of open, what we mean is free plus certain permissions. And to communicate what those permissions are, we rely on Creative Commons or some rights reserved. Creative Commons is just a nonprofit that helps us to communicate an author intent, which is insufficient under that all rights reserved or traditional copyright. And so through Creative Commons, we're able to communicate or be communicated with the intention that that creator has for what we are able to do with that piece of work. So open just refers to any educational resource, which could be a textbook, um, it could be a manual, it could be an infographic, any educational resource that has is, is free, but has an open license or some of those rights reserved. Now, what are those rights under Creative Commons? Well, Creative Commons really enables lots of cool things. If we look at that left-hand box, there are many possibilities which include copying a resource, sharing it, keeping it, using it forever. 
Those are all part of that process. But there are also other opportunities of, with a creative license beyond merely keeping and copying and sharing that resource. And that is you can also, under some licenses, edit a resource or remix it. And what we mean by that is you have the ability to create a derivative of that piece of work. And we're going to talk a lot about, for the remainder of our chat today, why being able to create a derivative can be really cool when we think about um, what, what, we, what we want out of a social justice pedagogy. But to be able to know whether an author wants you to create a derivative or not, you have to understand um, how Creative Commons licenses work. And that's those four really easy symbols for you on the right-hand side. Once you know these four symbols, you'll be able to determine if someone, what someone is communicating to you about their license. And if you're creating an OER, having familiarity with these will enable you to communicate to other folks what your intention is with that resource. If we look at that very top right hand, um, right hand corner symbol, that's a CC by license. All that license means is that that, that person um, you can keep, you can keep, download, share, use anything you'd like to do with their um, uh, educational resource, but they want attribution. They would like credit for that resource, which is pretty straightforward. The second one is a CCNC or non-commercial license. That means that author is telling you, hey, you can't make money off of my resource. So for example, you couldn't use my textbook or assign my textbook in your class and then ask every student to pay you a dollar that would technically violate the Creative Commons CCNC license. That third symbol there is the um, CCSA or share alike license. And what that license says is that if you're gonna create a derivative, if you're gonna edit a resource to create something new, that you, the author would like you to use the same license um, that they have allocated for that resource. And then the last license is that CCND. It is, in some cases, the most restrictive. It is a no derivatives license. That means um, you are able to copy, share, keep, use an open educational resource forever. But that author is saying, eh, I don't want you to edit or remix that resource. You can use it as is. Now, once you start to have an idea about what these symbols mean, you're going to really start to see and realize how common open educational resources are. For example, you may have used a TED Talk in your class. It usually uses a CC BY NC license, uh, an ND license, because TED Talk does not want you to create or remix the speaker's original information. But the great thing is uh, that Creative Commons license really allows you so many opportunities um, as an instructor or as an instructional designer, as folks who are supporting curricular development. Because that license enables you to do so much or whatever you're comfortable with. So if you're a faculty member, you might decide, I'm just going to adopt a one open textbook. I'm not going to remix anything but you'll be able to identify through a CC license what books are actually openly available. So you can just adopt an open textbook. And the open textbook library, if you aren't familiar, is a, a really huge repository of where you can go to locate any open textbooks that might be in your field or in your discipline. That's a great place to start. You could also mix and match, mix and match resources um, that are open. So for example, um, when I would assign a traditional publisher textbook that was expensive, even if that textbook didn't align with my learning outcomes, I still felt a lot of pressure to assign all of that content in the class for students to use because I felt like they were obligated. They should squeeze all the juice out of that textbook because it was incredibly expensive. But since the textbook is free, it enables you to be able and mix and match resources more effectively. For example, you might decide to assign an open textbook and then supplement it with an open chapter about information literacy or social justice research. You might, also, might look at the OER Commons, which is a really great repository that has tons of different assignments and activities, which also use that OER license. So because OERs aren't just textbook, when you're able to understand what that license means, it means you're also able to find archives and repositories that you can take up um, and be able to kind of mix and match to meet the specific learning outcomes of your class. Third, you can modify or edit a, uh, edit a text. 
Um, and by modifying, editing, creating a derivative, sometimes people think, whoa, who has time to be able to do that, right? It feels like you're creating a new resource, but not necessarily. And one of the courses that I supervise is called uh, Business Public Speaking. And I was looking for an open resource. I found a resource called Business Communication for Success. That openly licensed resource had tons of content about business writing and business public speaking, but I didn't really need the business writing content. So because it used a Creative Commons license that allowed editing, I copied the book and created a derivative that just deleted all the content that we didn't use and resulted in a business communication for success derivative that just focused on public speaking. So that kind of editing and modification was super helpful. Of course, you can also create something from scratch. You can create your own openly licensed resource that isn't just important for your students, but that that open license enables folks all over the world to be able to apply um, and to utilize either for their own learning purposes or for their own classrooms. So in other words, Creative Commons really allows us to move out of that purely privatized understanding of knowledge creation in favor of a much more collaborative and publicly accessible way of knowing. Um, and so there are tons of opportunities to think about open in relationship to social justice, even though for many of us, that idea of free is really maybe what first brought us to the idea of open. And that's certainly a key transition to answering the question, why should we use them? That notion of free is important. So in this section, we're really going to think critically about OER and in particular, how they can enable or be utilized alongside the values of social justice. But I'm gonna be explicit about something here. And that is there's actually nothing explicit about OERs as social justice on their own. Now, of course, providing free access is important and that's significant, but as we all know, putting a resource for free online is not in and of itself progressive or safe or equitable or empowering. And in fact, excuse me, um, Shanna Hollick really warns and writes that opening up access to a space online doesn't instantly make that space an inclusive one. And providing an open venue to publish educational materials doesn't in and of itself serve to amplify or aid marginalized voices. And that's because educational resources are part of a system which is in and of itself unequal. So we know higher education is not equitable. We know, for example, that there are increasing attacks on K through 12 education, which have negative um, impacts on students of color and low income students. We know that there are mental health crises that are happening for students on our campuses. Um, we know that budget cuts um, are resulting in pretty extraordinary measures and that there are attacks explicitly on these ideas of diversity and inclusion and, and equity. So because education, that system or structure isn't equitable, the resources aren't inherently equitable either. So what we have to do as educators is really ask ourselves, what can we control or how can we resist or reframe an educational experience in favor of something more social justice oriented? So that's what we have to think about when we're asking, how can OER um, be or relate to questions of social justice? we have to really think about the problems that students are facing. And we also have to think about our own values of social justice, our own, the things that we're already doing within our teaching to try to intervene within those structures. Because certainly there's potential to infuse an ethos and ethic into social justice, but we have to really ask ourselves, what are our values of social justice and how can we make sure those values are running and riding or at the front of the bus when we're integrating OERs into our classrooms. And for me, it's helpful to think about social justice as access, social justice as inclusion, and social justice as empowerment. And these, are, these kind of three frameworks are the way we're gonna talk about why we could use OER alongside social justice. So again, like I mentioned, that idea of free is often our first entry point into the idea of open. And that's because for many years now, our students have been telling us, um, hey, we can't afford the textbooks. It's becoming an increasing crisis. 
So when we talk about affordability for students as a barrier to access materials, we're really highlighting our commitment to social justice as a question of access because affordability is a real material issue that makes education inaccessible. It facilitates inequitable access to education. So if we care about social justice as access, then we care about the affordability crisis that students are facing. And we know that students are facing them because they tell us. I'm gonna share a little bit of data with you, some of which you might be familiar with and some of which you won't. And I do so because I think when we're trying to ask ourselves, how can we translate what we're doing to other people to highlight our commitments to diversity? Having access to this data is a way to tell that story to other people. So it's one thing to say to our department chairs or our deans, hey, um, resources are really expensive and students are telling us that it's expensive. Oftentimes we get met with a, well, college is expensive. So if you want to come to college, then you should be ready to pay those expenses. But this data helps us craft a little bit more persuasive of a narrative while still staying true to our own values of social justice. And this first data really tells us that the cost of textbooks has a negative impact on students. So this was a survey of, of more than 21,000 students. And they were asked to participate in this survey um, and they were asked, in your academic career, has the cost of required textbooks caused you to? You might not be surprised at that 64% response that they didn't purchase the textbook. That was my route when I was an undergraduate student and wasn't able to purchase the book. But I really wanna point your attention to those bottom three, um, that bottom three results. That almost 23% of students have been forced to drop a course withdraw from a course or fail a course because the books are so expensive. And it's important to think about the centrality of educational resources to student success, because if students can't access the materials, they cannot participate in the economy of knowledge that you're creating in your courses. And how could they then be successful? And more and more, we know that publishing companies are becoming savvy. So while I could, for example, um, use a library book, right, a course reserve in the library or not purchase the textbook, now online access codes mean that students can't, for example, buy a book or share a book with someone else. It also means that if students can't afford the book, oftentimes more and more they can't access the quizzes, they can't access the assignments. And so they are, it is impossible for them to try and find alternative routes to be able to participate within your course. So this data really tells us, hey, students are struggling and it's having an impact on our classes and their classroom experience. But does this prove that moving to OER will help re by reducing that affordability barrier? Will it have a positive impact on students? What's that academic impact? Well, luckily we know that it does. Um, so this is a survey of almost 22,000 students from the University of Georgia. And what they looked at with this data was the change in grade and the drop fail withdrawal rate change for when a class from when a class had a traditional um, textbook to when they transitioned to using OERs. So what you'll notice at the bottom there is that all students saw an increase in their grade of almost 9% and a drop, a reduction of the drop fail withdrawal rate to 2.68%. And that alone really helps us understand the connection between our commitments to things like access and social justice and student success. But it adds even more complexity and nuance when we look at that second part of the second part of the results, which are Pell eligible students, that some of our most vulnerable students look at how much their grade increased by nearly 11% and a drop fail withdrawal rate that went even less. So this data, again, is helpful for us to translate the choices that you're making for other people to highlight the impact that these choices are having on students with that framework of social justice as access in mind. So it helps us use this data, especially if you're in a location like I am, where increasingly diversity is a dirty word, that I can still use this data to create a narrative um, which translates to the institutional, to institution, to the institution. Like, hey, uh, using OER could help our enrollment numbers because less students drop. 
hey, this could really help our majors because students can keep the resource for their entire educational career rather than coming into our major with an introductory course where then they lose access to that content after the semester. So I say that because it can be really important that whatever you're doing to, to think about how you're crafting that narrative for other folks to make it be translatable. So yes, when we think about the potential of OER within access, we know that it has a positive impact on student success. And every year I report on my annual um, you know, faculty promotion fund, um, I use this kind of data to say, this is how much money we have saved for students by using an OER. So beyond that question of OER as access, how else might OERs relate to this question of social justice? Um, and we're gonna first and foremost think about it from the perspective of inclusion. So we've talked about social justice as access. What does it mean if we're defining social justice as inclusion? What's the potential of, for OERs within that framework? And by social justice as inclusion, what we're really asking is, do your students see themselves in the content? Um, do your learners see themselves? We often talk about this as identification within communication studies. You likely have heard research that shows that if a student has a faculty member or a teacher who looks like them, they're more likely to be successful, they're more likely to be retained. But this is true about resources too, because if a student sees themselves in the resources, in the discipline, it can contribute to a sense of belonging and inclusion. Too often we rely on our belief that our content is neutral, but OERs are really enabling us to adjust and modify content to think about whether or not that content is reflective of the student experiences and the students that we have in our actual courses. So oftentimes this means asking questions of the content that you're going to adopt or asking questions about the content that you're interested in adapting, like where is the content from? What authors? Who or what is represented within the content? What are the examples that are present? What are the images that are used? Who, are, who is being um, identified as exemplar within that book? And also importantly, who is left out or absent within, these, within the content? Do the examples speak to the specific cultural realities of your students? And I really encourage you all also to think about some of the discipline specific conversations that are happening for you all. Um, are, they, are there criticisms about, for example, the kind of whitewashed history of your discipline? And can you aid in adjusting that content when you're thinking about adapting or editing or creating a derivative? So for example, when I was creating the uh, public speaking textbook, I really asked myself or really noticed in, in more traditional publisher textbooks that all of the examples, all the photos about what a good public speaker looked like were all presidents. And there's something, as we all know, kind of missing when we're only looking at presidents as representational of our history and that's representation itself. So uh, I also, we also were having um, lots of conversations in my discipline about where the roots of the discipline began. Is it really Aristotelian rhetoric as the only place where public speaking emerges? Or can we acknowledge there are lots of other cultural entry points that might be more closely related to the cultural experiences of students? So when I think about this question of inclusion, it was important for me to think about my examples, to consider the historical narrative that I'm amplifying, and also to do things like use they, them pronouns. Again, creating things within the text that assist students in seeing themselves in the discipline. And again, the Creative Commons license allows us to more easily do this by customization or inclusion through customization. Because remember, your Creative Commons license allows us to more easily update and adapt content without having to start from scratch or without relying on traditional publishers who are making monetary choices over cultural choices. So in terms of customization where you're able to create a derivative, here's an example. So this is a textbook called Introduction to Sociology. It's out of OpenStax. OpenStax was a kind of leader in creating open textbooks. But the problem is that sociology is about the study of culture. 
And certainly then all applications of this textbook wouldn't be universally true because culture is complex, it's nuanced. So what, oh, what the Creative Commons license allowed is it allowed an introduction to sociology, the second Canadian edition. So a Creative Commons license allows us to say, we don't have to, there are some things that we don't have to rewrite over and over and over and over again, but there are content, there is content within, in books that may be exclusionary. So the second edition, of course, allowed updates to things like spelling but it also allowed examples around culture to be specific to Canada and the cultural values and realities of Canada so that students, again, can see themselves and be connected to the content. In addition to just content customization, um, we can also think about social justice as empowerment. Um, and by social justice as empowerment, we don't just mean that we provide students access. We don't just mean that students see themselves in the content. Social justice as empowerment means giving students the ability to craft their own narratives, right, to speak for themselves. And this is where open pedagogy under the kind of broad spectrum of open educational resources really enters the conversation. Open pedagogy is just the idea that you're using, you're creating uh, materials with students. So you're co-constructing those materials and then you're often using a Creative Commons license to provide, those, provide other folks access to those materials. So students are able to work with you to construct either an open textbook. It could be an open handbook. Um, it could be a series of narratives or vignettes, whatever is specific to your discipline. So this is a move I would say more in line with things like critical pedagogy, the acknowledgement that students are themselves smart, autonomous individuals. Um, who should have a say in how that curriculum, how the curriculum is constructed. There are tons of examples about how open pedagogy can function. A few that I love are, um, uh, there are folks online who advocate for working with students to create a test pool or an exam pool. Because if, it, as instructional designers likely know, it's one thing to test your knowledge by answering a question someone else wrote but to develop higher levels of thinking, helping and teaching students how to write the questions can also be a real, can really aid in their understanding. Here are a few other examples when we think about the potential of open pedagogy. So this is a project I developed in 2022. It's called the Public Speaking Open Pedagogy Project. So I teach a graduate level pedagogy course every year. And what I noticed after writing the textbook was that while we've been doing a better job with open textbooks to provide free access to these to um, content, most of our resources, our assignments, our activities were still highly privatized. So there are hundreds, thousands of persuasive speech descriptions, assignments that are happening out there. So through this open pedagogy project with graduate students, um, they developed a whole host of assignments and activities that they then used a Creative Commons license to share out with other folks who are teaching public speaking. So this allowed them to understand the process of creating an instructor resource. It gave them a, a autonomy and allowed them to be empowered to really create those resources and share them out. Of course, that allows more inclusivity because it's not just me creating that material to be shared out with other people. The secondary example um, is an undergraduate example of a textbook that was created at Clemson University, where undergraduate students really created this textbook that looked at and that took an ecological approach to obesity and eating disorders. So throughout the entirety of the semester, the faculty member facilitated students in locating, writing, and peer editing each of the chapters within this book that again is now openly available for students. So when we think about the, those questions of access, inclusion, and empowerment, there are lots of opportunities using that Creative Commons license to think about your goals or your outcomes for your own courses. But it's not just about what we say in the book that can enable different kinds of social justice values. We can also have opportunities to think about different forms or formats. In other words, how do you want to represent, inclusively represent your content for other people? 
So not only are you able to adapt and adjust content to be more inclusive and empowering, you're also able to challenge the traditional format of a book to ask yourself, well, not only what should be said, but how should it be represented? How could it be communicated? And to allow different creative forms that might also serve towards student inclusivity and empowerment. So for example, you might work with students um, to allow them to do uh, student annotations directly on a piece of content where they're able to live react and respond to an open book and be themselves contributors where you can track those questions and annotations. You might, in order to resist, resist the kind of real textual hegemony that happens within our educational resources, that privilege for everything to always be text, you can also change the format to be um, oral or audio presentations. You could ask students to create a podcast of your open textbook right, that could allow an increased accessibility. You could ask yourself, hmm, do I only want my open resource to be in one language? Are there opportunities for more formats and more accessibility around language use or using visual performances, poetry, using zines or zines, infographics where students can help and represent the information? So I mention it because when we think broadly about the potential of open as social justice, what we're really doing is helping understand um, and facilitate challenging conversations with students and really asking them to challenge what we're assuming as normal, natural educational experiences. So open allows us to say what and what do we want to do that's inclusive in content and how do we want to creatively bring that content to a different form given what our students might need. And here are two examples um, that really help demonstrate that a social justice focus enables really interesting avenues when creating openly accessible um, curricular materials. So here are two examples that you could use as assignments within your courses. Because remember, an open educational resource isn't just a full textbook, a 20 chapter textbook. It could be a one page infographic that you create with students and use a Creative Commons license to share out. So there's tons of potential. Here are two sample assignments. The first is called a teach out model of an assignment. And the teach out model was created by a group of scholars out of Michigan. The goal of a teach out model is to use your discipline to try and explore a relevant or cultural issue, often a sort of social justice issue, where you ask students to engage with that issue, and then you ask them to consider what form they would like their engagement to take that you can share out with other folks. For example, there are some great there are some great examples of classes who around natural science who ask their students to think about natural science contemporarily and from an indigenous perspective. Right, so how might be able to share those out? The second um, is to think about historical interventions or introductions, and that is to ask students to do research that might challenge a kind of normal narrative about how your discipline has unfolded, and then share those retellings um, in, for example, uh, an open and some kind of open um, resource. So, for example, for me, I've asked students to locate an underrepresented historical speaker and create an, uh, an infographic that highlights that speaker's significance. So what we're doing is really kind of creating a, almost a global resource pool by elevating and visibilizing low power historical speakers and including student work, being, um, allowing them to become the teachers to help other folks see what otherwise has become invisibilized. So those are a few when we think about these questions of why should we use them with those values of access, empowerment, and inclusion in mind. But there are some practical considerations that can often keep us up at night when we're trying to think about the feasibility of using OERs within our own courses. And so I know that many of us are in different phases. And so we're really gonna talk about practicality from any entry point with your experience with open. Um, so very, very practically that means if you're just interested in adopting or looking at uh, an archive of resources, like I've already mentioned, I would suggest the open textbook library. Right? If that's your entry point, amazing. Um, go ahead and take a look, see if there are any books within your discipline um, at your leisure 
uh, see if any of those might benefit um, your students. Now, if you're in, 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 in um, a kind of phase two, where you're interested in actually adapting an already open resource, and there are lots of reasons why we might want to adapt. Um, for example, have it more specific to your students, align it more with the learning outcomes of your class. If you're adapting, one of the most common questions I get is, how do I host it? Where does it live? Um, what do I do with that open resource? And for me, I've had experience with all three. So Pressbooks, if you aren't familiar, is a platform that uh, a huge amount of open textbooks use. Um, I would really recommend Pressbooks, and it doesn't have to be a traditional book by any means, but Pressbooks is really user-friendly. They have great support. Some of your institutions might actually already have an institutional license for access to Pressbooks. Manifold um, is another online software platform that folks are beginning to use. In my experience, this is a lot more flexible for what I would call creative form, different kinds of creative OER formats. Manifold is where we're ho currently housing the Open Public Speaking Pedagogy Project. And you can also just use an online PDF. So you could create an online PDF. You could submit it to the OER Commons for them to host that resource. You could also use or ask for your online PDF to be in your um, online access repository at your university. So at the University of Kansas, we have something called KU ScholarWorks. So I have a PDF copy of the book also available in KU ScholarWorks. So you can begin to really think about where you want it to live, but know that even if you do an online PDF in a repository, it can still be often found and still be a really great alternative. But regardless of where you want that to live, or if you're adopting something already in the open textbook library, it's really important to consider questions of accessibility. And not just access, can they get it online, but really thinking through questions of accessibility. So it looks like Karna is saying that the grant covers access to Pressbooks, which is amazing. In my experience, Pressbooks was exemplar in checking and providing accessibility measures, which includes um, locations to create alternative text for pictures. I also really recommend working with your Student Access Center to run any resource that you create, oftentimes through their accessibility kind of check. That includes them usually seeing if a screen, how, it, how it corresponds with a screen reader, for example, assistance with things like closed captioning, if you're going to create a kind of more live video or presentation component. Um, and also in terms of accessibility, that even if you're using something like Pressbooks or Manifold, realizing that providing students with a PDF copy of your resource is imperative, because if it's only available online, we're still assuming that students have technological access to the internet at all times. So if one of our goals with student with social justice is access is to make sure that folks have access all of the time, we want to provide them with a copy of our resource that they can download and keep um, and doesn't require that internet access or that live access. So we have this idea maybe of where they might live and how we can make them accessible. But you also might be asking yourself, oh, what license should I use if I'm creating my own OER? Well, luckily, you already have some kind of understanding now about how these different kinds of, um, of symbols, the kind of Creative Commons license that you can create. So really asking for yourself, um, what do I want to make sure I'm communicating as an author? What kind of intention do I have for other people about what should be allowed for my resource? And one thing that's important is having the most flexible license does not necessarily mean that your resource is the most inclusive. Oftentimes folks will say, oh, I, everyone should be able to create a derivative. Everyone should be able to remix or edit any open resource. But certainly when we think about questions of social justice, if we look a little bit more clearly, if we're having resources where, for example, we're inviting marginalized folks to share their stories, we're asking students to create original creative works, then it might not be appropriate to invite derivatives. So please note that don't feel like if you decide on a CCND license, no derivative, that that somehow automatically cancels out your commitments to social justice. That in fact, 
Sometimes creating a CCND license is a highly practical and ethical way to protect your students and the work that they have created originally. If you still aren't sure about a license, I'm 100% positive that you all have resources and librarians in particular who can kind of help answer some of those questions for you. The other practical thing I want to mention about your license is that if you're working with students, if you're going to use student work in your resource, then work with your general counsel in order to create a release form that they approve. Because remember, you're going to be sharing work online or, or publicly. So you want to craft a form so that students understand what it means to share their work. And that also means you can think about what you want that form to include. For example, when I've done open pedagogy work with students, um, I ask them usually to select the license for their own piece of work. And that means they have an understanding about what we mean by OER. Because one of the important parts about using OER in our classes is like letting students in on it, is telling them why we're using it, giving them some information about their significance. So if you're thinking about what license, you also want to figure out what, what um, allowing students, for example, to select their own license, allowing students to determine what name, if any, they want to use to be accompanied with their work. Because yes, open pedagogy can have the potential, the potential um, to infuse social justice as empowerment. But if your students feel coerced to sign that paperwork, if they feel like their grade is reliant on them creating a piece of public work that, that they aren't yet comfortable with, then that's not empowerment, that's coercion, right? So again, we want to be careful about um, the expectation that I'm doing really empowering, inclusive work. I'm requiring all of my students to create a presentation that I'm going to put online. Um, but then behind the scenes, you have students who are at a low power differential than you and feel really obligated to participate in sharing, even if they aren't comfortable. So you want to be clear that you have the form, that students know what it means to make their work publicly available, and that they also have the power and autonomy to say no or create an alternative assignment. When we think about this kind of license, this is what my license is for my um, textbook. I use a CC BY NC share alike license. And the reason I do that is because you'll see at the top about 15% of this book is remixed from, an, from a previous open public speaking textbook. And this is the license that that public speaking textbook used. So since it has an essay license, a share alike license, it meant that I needed to use the same CC license that they used. So CC by note that no one, you can't make money from it. And someone is able and invited to create a derivative um, if they like of my work. In fact, I just accidentally online found one of my chapters in another open textbook, which was really a cool thing um, actually to see. So the next question I think can be important is how do, how do these work for a large multi-section course? Um, and I know this can be particularly difficult if you're someone who has to select educational resources for a multi-section course when, for example, you might have instructors, adjuncts who were able to select their own book previously. This is the most difficult if you're making that change. Um, but I'm hoping that this section, I'll, I'll highlight to you some of the strategies that I used. And one thing I want to remind is the goal, the sort of ethos of open is collaborative. And I put this map up here as a metaphor, because often what I suggest folks do is really help um, folks who are going to be using the book, help them understand that the book is like a map, okay? that the map helps guide instructors toward the specific learning outcomes of the course, but that instructors have the flexibility along that map to stop where they choose to decide how long they're gonna stay in each part of that map, for example, that they can still infuse their own areas of expertise. So it's very difficult, it can be very difficult and not as successful if you come in and say, this is the book you will use, I don't want your participation in it in any way at all. But if instead you help gain more insight into why you've selected the book, how it better aligns with the learning outcomes and be clear with those graduate students or other faculty and instructors, what flexibility they have to be able to supplement, it can be, much, it can be much, much more successful when meeting hesitation. And that usually means, for me, trying to prioritize creating a community of inquiry. Ask for feedback, 
about, ask for feedback, um, ask folks to review the textbook if they're able to, talk about it with them, right? talk about the choices, share the data that I've shared with you today so that you give more insight into the choice that you've made about developing an OER and in particular the requirement for those larger multi-section courses to use that OER. The other thing you can do is to um, ask folks to participate by co-constructing resources together, um, co-creating assignments, or even creating a joint resource pool, um, or you know, encouraging supplemental content. So uh, directing them to the open textbook library, for example. Um, I think you know, most of these can also be helpful and have, has been the most successful for me when I help instructors understand that Using open in the class is also helpful in improving student relations. And what I mean is when you um, make a choice and you talk about that choice with students, it helps them increase their trust because they, they believe that you're making choices in their best interest. So again, like I said, when I use open in my classes, I add something about open in the syllabus. I talk about it right away on day one, why I'm choosing an open book and an open textbook. And translating the kind of positive benefits that that can have on an instructor and student relationship can also be really helpful across those multi-section courses. But to be successful, talking about it, increasing your transparency, inviting feedback, co-creating resources together or creating resource pools, all of these are opportunities that can sometimes soften the blow, especially if there is an appearance that you're impeding on academic freedom. I also get lots of questions, which is never maybe the, the sexiest conversation to talk about, but an important one, which is how do we assess this, right? How do we assess our use of OER, especially around questions of diversity and social justice? But to answer this question, uh, like any time we have a conversation about assessment, we wanna ask ourselves, well, what do we wanna know? What are we trying to measure? What are we trying to assess? when we're implementing or integrating OER into our courses. And for me, the most common, just like the data that I previously shared with you, is there are opportunities for you to measure drop, fail, withdrawal rates between courses that were previously more traditional in use and the implementation after OER. This was something that I wanted to do um, when we implemented our open textbook in 2019, is to look at data from the previous three years to look at those drop fail withdrawal rates, we really had the opportunity to aggregate that to look at different student categories and identities. And then we wanted to look at the, la the, the three years after implementing the, the textbook. As you may know, um, in 2020, COVID happened. And so because there were an incredible amount of additional variables um, that we couldn't quite account for, we weren't able to use that data. But it's definitely an opportunity that, that you all could use is to measure and determine if there is a change in drop fail withdrawal rates once you implement open. Um, you can also do assignment comparisons. So if you have a few sections where instructors are still selecting their own traditional materials and a few sections this fall, for example, where you're implementing open, if you have a set assignment across those different courses, you could develop uh, um, a kind of assessment or a rubric where you look at those assignment comparisons and determine if there are any changes or what the differences are within those, those, those pieces of student work. The last idea is, thinking about assessment is to, to create an experiment or to create an educational intervention, um, whereby, of course, a pretty straightforward, you use um, a pre and post test where they take a pre-survey, you provide them with an OER, and then they take that kind of post survey. Certainly that kind of educational intervention isn't unique to OER, but what it can enable is you can, based on that data, share out that educational intervention, which is then again, open and freely available for other faculty in your discipline to be able to implement. But when we think about questions of assessment, we also wanna think about um, assessing our impact and thinking about opportunities for OER. And so when you're thinking about assessing your impact, especially if you're gonna use Pressbooks, I strongly recommend that you embed Google Analytics into your Pressbooks OER. It's very simple to do, it's super user-friendly. And what that enables is you to track and trace the user impact for your resource. 
I'm able to see, for example, really practical data for me, what chapters are being used more than others, but also really important impact data, like the amount of monthly users, where in the world people are using that resource from, so that you're able to translate the impact of your OER, especially with that question of access, beyond just your class and to think globally. Now, when I first started thinking about open and started thinking about writing a textbook, for me, I thought no one's gonna use this <laughs> outside of just KU. And I really, um, I really, I didn't consider the need, right? The kind of the, that, that folks had for accessing a free public speaking resource online, where now I usually have anywhere from 50 to 100,000 global active users. Um, the, I see folks in the Philippines predominantly using and downloading the book. Over 50 universities have adopted the book. So when you're able to do simple things like add Google Analytics, you can start to really trace the impact and then use that language of social justice to translate the importance of that impact on the resource you've created. When we also talk about tracing the impact, since I'm a communication scholar, I always want to mention that one of the difficulties, one of the hesitations that people have in, in um, you know, using their time and labor for open is that it can be difficult to translate into our departments and into our institutions, because unfortunately, that kind of stronghold of a traditional copyright method tells us that if we're first author, we're the best. If it's our original content, we're the best. That's what counts. So what we really need to do is be working on our own departmental talk, the way that we are visibilizing the labor of this work, how we're um, applauding it, what we're doing to make this work count within our own departments to try and incentivize other folks to advance these sort of conversations. And that also means for me, especially invested in social justice, is to really asking how we're including or excluding our vulnerable faculty populations, including contingent and adjunct faculty. Um, are we thinking about them as collaborators in this process, especially because at KU, our contingent adjunct faculty are teaching way more students than our tenure track and tenured faculty members are. They have so much important knowledge about the curricular changes that need to be made. So are we inviting those faculty into conversations or are we merely using the development of these resources as a method to create or distance ourselves, to reaffirm those faculty categories? Those are important conversations and considerations I always wanna mention. And then lastly, when we think pra practically is really trying to feel comfortable answering some of the major concerns or questions that people might have about OER that I get pretty regularly from faculty. One of the questions I often get is, who in the world has time to create a new OER, right? And oftentimes um, folks have this idea that if you're creating an open or creating a textbook that you're just like in your basement all alone writing from scratch that there's you know there's no support. And I will admit that my office is in my basement and I did write a majority of my textbook down here. Um, but really, again, this question of time, one is important because we know faculty members are really out of time they're being asked to do a lot more with less. But this is an opportunity to remind folks that first, first of all. Um, just checking out the open textbook library, seeing what's available can be a great first step. And also that the ethos of OER is about collaboration. So really um, asking or thinking about who on your campus could assist in instructional design. What are grant opportunities that your university or libraries have that you might not know about to try and incentivize the adoption or adaptation, or even to help other folks know I hear you, time is really precious. Um, it might be a good idea the next time you're thinking of changing your textbook or resources to consider open within that field of possibilities. I think the other important question that we can get is this question of academic freedom. So what about academic freedom? And I think this happens most predominantly when faculty feel pressured to select an open resource or feel like they don't have a say because they're teaching, like we'd mentioned that multi-section course. Um, there's no sort of silver bullet response to this question of academic freedom. I think with any question, it's important to let folks know, I trust you, I trust your expertise, 
um, and foreground that as a response first and foremost. It can be helpful, especially in those multi-section courses to ask for their input and also to really help again, disclose the parameters of flexibility. So, hey, um, you know, this can enable the creation of something new. You're able to supplement it with other kinds of chapters or your own kinds of expertise and really helping provide some of that data so folks have an understanding about balancing institutional and student needs along with instructor needs or that idea of um, academic freedom. The other thing I'll often tell folks too in my, in my sections when they're a little bit prickly about being told what textbook they have to use is, that you know the beautiful part about open is that there aren't they aren't tethered to assigning every single word like i'd mentioned earlier they don't have that kind of um, overwhelming feeling that they need to assign everything because students have spent a hundred dollars on their textbook so just helping those instructors know where they still have a lot of flexibility and perhaps even more flexibility than they had before and the last question i often get is are they any good? Again, that same vision of someone just in their basement with no support writing their book. Um, and the answer to this question is some are and some aren't, right? We would never say that every traditional, every textbook published under the traditional model is 100% amazing, that everything is great, you know, universally. And we wouldn't say the same for open either. All we can ever do is say, Faculty are experts in their field, and they're making a choice about whether or not an open resource or an openly licensed uh, educational resource is right for the specific learning outcomes that they have in their course, um, for the specific student needs that they have, and whether or not that resource is able to do things like provide access, have inclusive representation of content, and help empower students. So we trust folks to make their to make choices, but all books are not good and all books are not all bad. Right? So I'm sure you all have uh, have gotten lots of other questions or maybe even have other questions on your own. But overall, I think it's important to remember if you care about questions of social justice, I think that's why you're here. Um, if you care about addressing unequal power relations that are happening within higher education, that focusing on educational resources has a lot of potential and it should be done alongside many of the other praxis-based choices you're making in your classrooms to try and create a more just environment for students. So open education isn't uniquely social justice oriented, but absolutely using that Creative Commons license, providing free resources for students can enable many of those social justice values that I know most of us hold. So I know we've got some time left um, and I'd be happy to um, answer any questions for you. I've also put my email here, my website. So please, if you think of something else in the future, I know you have a, a great folks here who can answer those questions, but do please feel um, empowered to reach out and email as well. I just want to quickly say thank you so much, Maggie. And I think we're getting some virtual claps. This was really wonderful. And um, as Karna mentioned, feel free to unmic if you feel comfortable. If not, you can put it in the chat. And Misha, I see that you've unmuted. Yeah. I uh, first of all, thank you. This was so wonderful and so helpful, and like just sort of helped put things into sort of a, a nice sort of framework that was great. So yes, thank you so much. I'm wondering, could you talk a little bit about promoting? OER, like when you've created an OER, what kind of things you do to help get the message out? That's such a good, that's such a great question. You know, um, it's a hard question a little bit. So um, I was a little, I had some anxiety, you know, um, in kind of sharing out the resource initially at first, like I'd mentioned, I really only thought we would be adopting it at KU. But I was still trying to do some publicity, publicity things. I did rely on the libraries to assist in some of that some of that marketing. What I also did is I shared the book out on our national communication listserv. So through our national organization, um, making sure folks knew using that resource. Um, I, I kind of made a little kind of infographic -y blurb that I also shared out with kind of like-minded folks in similar positions across universities. So my position as introductory course director is common amongst large universities, I just sent that out 
um, and made folks aware of, of the book and made them aware that we created instructor resources, because certainly that's a question people have, especially if they have a lot of adjunct faculty members, right? We need to provide those folks with some support and resources. And the third thing I'll say is I just added myself to as many um, discipline specific Facebook groups as I could. And I shared out that link um, that way. You know, the beautiful part about open is it's so much easier than saying, hey, go log into your library, um, you know, repository and use your credentials to, to download my journal article. Or, hey, here's the link to this textbook, which is $75, right? They really are able to see immediately and click on the link to get an experience of the book. And so that's been, that's, those are the kind of strategies that I've used. Thank you. Yeah. I'll also mention, you know, OERs are a living document, so don't feel afraid to hit publish um, in your press books if you're editing something because it's so easy um, and it really does facilitate editing your own work, right, is getting feedback, is being open, um, and that kind of fear, I think, that we have um, as researchers and scholars of the last copyrighted manuscript is, is there in the world and we can never touch it again. That's not true when we think about OER anymore, that we are able to view it as living, that we are forgiving of ourselves, that we can go in and change and modify in a way that's really beautiful. Gonna have to check out this chapter that was just shared. Thank you, Cynthia. We don't have any other questions. We still have a few minutes. Um, thank you. And for the OER for social justice faculty, Maggie, the faculty are just right in the middle of their divine um, uh, and creating their outline for the OER with their learning objectives, thinking of assessments. So if any of the faculty wanna share about what you've been working on so far is also a good opportunity to, to do that as well. Maggie, maybe while you're, while folks are thinking a little bit, having worked with you, I know that a lot of your colleagues are really receptive to OER, but did you have any resistance from folks when you were implementing the OER into your class and how did you handle that from maybe faculties, faculty or students? That's a great question. Um, you know, I really, I didn't. Um, I think I had, um, there was some uh, dramatic backstory in my position before I entered. And so my position was a little bit on an island. They really sort of allowed me, enabled me to do what I needed. And the nice thing is my department chair was my position in the interim. So he really kind of understood, I think, the weight of choosing those materials. Um, and so it really helped that I was able to kind of provide data that he could 
go up the chain with also. So one of the, although he wasn't resistant, I don't think he realized the full potential of how going to the department dean when you're asking for resources or when you're saying, here's how we're showing up for students, the real positive impact that it can have when you say, hey, we're doing our part. We're just, we, we've just saved students $300,000 a year. We know that this can help in retention and enrollment efforts. Um, and so even if you don't have, if you have folks who are resistant, I think really being understanding of that resistance, because oftentimes it's just a lack of awareness and a lack of understanding. You know, we have an, an, a, this belief that like peer review could never happen with open, which also is not true. Um, I also, you know, I, I participated in the peer review process for more traditional publishers, and I wouldn't say there's much of a difference in how you can facilitate those. So oftentimes I think really figuring out what does this hesitation seem to be about? Is it a kind of myth about open? open? Um, sometimes faculty have long-term relationships with publishing reps. And so um, really trying to think about what their hesitation is about, trying to lead with grace, and then trying to provide data, trying to provide evidence, which we have, about why open can be super beneficial. Thank you. That's really good to hear. Nikki, I had a quick question for you. Um, uh, most of our teams are getting ready to start developing their OER and getting to the, the weeds of writing and um, adapting. Do you have any tips for how how to get these major blocks of writing or creating, developing done? Um, there's a it's a large lift. It how is. Yes, it is. So I think it depends if you're primarily starting from scratch or if you are editing or adapting. So for example, if you're realizing you're going to adapt, um, uh, but still use a significant amount of text, especially if they're in press books, you have the ability to clone the book, which is an amazing, something incredible, incredibly amazing. Um, so it means that you're able to clone the book, and then you can even, once you clone it, download it into kind of Word um, and then have it be offline and easily be able to re-upload it. Um, and so that can really save, I think, a lot of time uh, when, when you're thinking about designing. I also think it can be helpful to consider like chunks, right? So it can be overwhelming, you know, just like when you write a dissertation to think, oh my gosh, how am I ever going to finish this entire dissertation? As opposed to saying, okay, what am I, what's the goals? What are the learning outcomes that are associated with this resource? And then how can we organize it into smaller chunks that, that is more manageable? So for me, the book, the 15% of the book I used wasn't available on Pressbooks. It was just a PDF online. So what I did is convert that PDF to a Word document. Um, and then I um, went through, and I'm a qualitative researcher, so kind of started to code the chunks of content that I was going to use and then put those into um, Word documents that I labeled for each chapter. So I had a Word document for each chapter and Pressbooks seamlessly enabled me to upload those chapters um, directly into the platform. So hopefully that might help a little. I'll also say if you have a if, if, if you know you're working with an author that only has a PDF or is using Manifold and you can't clone it, or just reach out to the author and ask if they're, especially if they have a Creative Commons license and say, hey, do you by chance have Word document um, of this chapter, for example? It might not have to be everything. Um, oftentimes I've never had an author, unless they've been retired, say no, because that's the point. That's the, that's the sort of goal. That's the spirit of, of OER. Yeah, Leslie, the cloning is incredibly easy. I remember when I found it, it was magical. And this is looking forward to, and, and you kind of touched on this briefly, Maggie, but we do have a lot of faculty who are pre-tenure and trying to juggle research and getting their OER um, actually completed. How, because you have to go through the promotion process as well, how did you kind of present this OER in your portfolio and how did you really kind of um, get it to kind of, you know, quote unquote count for your your reviews and things like that? That's a great question. So those uh, kind of Google Analytics helped pretty significantly. I also believe I had um, some letters 
from faculty who had adopted the book. So one thing I also did in terms of impact is on my book, I wrote, hey, I have instructor resources. You should email me for access. And every time someone did, I asked them to write me something on their letterhead, which confirmed when they were, when they, where they were adopting it and how many sections and how many students so that I was able to trace that, but not just informally on my own, really using it with their own letterhead. So that I had kind of compiled then this Google analytic impact data along with instructors um, and faculty members who were able to speak to the significance of the book. So those really enabled me to talk about the, the impact and the work um, and why it was important. And I also, I do use it as opportunities to create conference panels, for example, so that, you know, most disciplines, there are some areas within their fields where they can talk about the kind of pedagogy of that field. That's pretty strong in communication. So finding opportunities that the, the institution says, well, that's more research-based, that counts more as research, to try to do a little bit of work to say, you're right, it is. Um, and I'm presenting on those findings at this research conference. The letterhead is a really, that's clever. I like that, mm -hmm. how you submit something on their letterhead so then you can just plunk it into your portfolio. Yeah. It's really good. Yes, past Maggie did great things for future Maggie. She doesn't always, but that was a great, <laughs> a great tip. I didn't do it at first, but when I first thought of it, I thought, okay, here we go. <laughs> Maggie, her protein that day. Yes. <laughs> And like I mentioned, as you're diving in, I'm sure questions will come up. Please do feel, don't feel like the conversation ends here. If there are other things I can do to support, or if you have questions about how I might've done, done something, um, I, I really sort of welcome, welcome those emails. I just want to say thank you again. Mate. This was like such a wonderful talk. We've been talking about this for the year and a half in the grant. And I know the faculty are just so appreciative to see another faculty member who's done the work and, and sharing your expertise. Um, just a reminder to everyone, the recording will be available within about a week or so. So uh, you can always come back and watch and, and reach out to Maggie and then anyone on the OER for Social Justice team for additional support. Thanks so much, everyone.